As you may already know, ElderWorks is a not-for-profit organization supporting any older adult or senior who has aging questions, needs referrals for assisted living, memory care, home care agencies, or other senior housing options. Our complimentary services are always available to you. Just give us a call at 855-462-0100 or visit our website, elderworks.org, E-L-D-E-R-W-E-R-K-S.org where you'll find hundreds and hundreds of articles and supportive material to help you through the aging process. Again, thank you for taking aging seriously and planning for your future needs. Enjoy ElderWorks Expo. It's my pleasure to introduce today, Dr. Michael Harvey. He's going to be teaching a seminar on understanding joint replacement, replacement options. Dr. Harvey specializes in hip and knee replacement surgery, including primary and complex revision cases. He has a special interest in outpatient surgery, minimally invasive techniques, and rapid recovery protocols that improve his patient's satisfaction and surgical outcomes. Dr. Harvey is dedicated to advancing the field of orthopedics and educating his fellow peers and potential patients. He is here today to give an educational lecture on hip and knee arthritis. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Harvey. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, I just want to introduce to uh, Jenna Carnell. She's my um, basically team lead at North of Illinois, so she handles a lot of uh, groundwork and takes care of a lot of business for me. So wouldn't be here today without her help. So thank you. All right, so um, they kind of mentioned it a little bit more about myself um, and my hospital affiliation. So I'm I'm out of a Ortho, Illinois group. We're mostly out of Algonquin and Elgin area. Um, I'm credentialed at hospitals in Huntley, right here down the street at St. Alexius and Hoffman Estates, um, as well as some hospitals in Elgin. Um, she already talked about my training. So just to break down to what we're going to talk about today, um, I'm just going to understand joint pain, kind of a very uh, superficial overlook at you know, why your hip or knee might be hurting. Um, different ways that we can treat hip or knee pain, um, depending on what the cause of your pain is. Um, and then we'll kind of dive into joint replacement surgery, uh, my cup of tea. Um, go over the expectations of recovery after a hip or knee replacement surgery. Um, and then we'll open it up at the end for some, some questions. Um, so as you all know, your joints are involved in everything you do, um, every motion you make, every step you take, you're putting stress and using your, your hips and, and knees. And you know, the hips and the knees, they're, they're weight-bearing joints, so they see a lot of grunt work. Um, you know, anything as simple as walking to, to running, jogging, going up and down stairs, even rising up from a seated position, you're putting a lot of stress through your, your hips and your knees. So if there's a, an issue that you're having, um, you're going to notice it every day, and it's going to start to affect you know, everything that you do. Um, so some of the more common causes of joint pain, um, and this is kind of generalized joint pain, but it does really pertain to, to hip and knee, which is what I specialize in. Um, we all have heard of rheumatoid arthritis, uh, basically a systemic condition where uh, your body creates antibodies that unintentionally attack the healthy joints in your body. And that can range from anywhere to the joints in your neck, your hands, your lumbar spine, your hips, your knees, your feet, basically anywhere. Um, you know, luckily over the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a lot of medical advancements in, in medications and medical treatments for rheumatoid arthritis. So we are less commonly seeing patients with rheumatologic manifestations of hip and knee disease uh, and treating more of that second entity up there, which is the osteoarthritis. Um, we, we call it a wear and tear disease. It's a degenerative condition. Um, basically over time, from the stress that's put through the hips and the knees on the cartilage, um, there's just wear and tear, just like treads on a tire. Um, so over time, um, the cartilage of the hips and knees can get thin, it can form cracks or fissures, it can break down, um, and, and that's really when you get a lot of the symptoms, such as pain, swelling, stiffness uh, from the arthritis. And there's multiple conditions that can predispose you to osteoarthritis, um, but that'd be a whole separate talk, so we won't go into all that today. Um, and then post-traumatic arthritis we do see fairly commonly as well. That's more so in the, the younger population, if they had a severe injury that's damaged the 
cartilage or the bone around the hip or the knee, um, those patients are, are predisposed to developing arthritis um, more early and in a more rapid rate than just your traditional wear and tear osteoarthritis. And as you can see, 54 million Americans, and it's definitely more than that now, that are, are suffering from uh, arthritis of the joints. Um, I tend to be a pretty conservative surgeon, um, so whenever I see patients that I'm treating for osteoarthritis of the hip or the knee, uh, I tend to discuss and pursue non-surgical treatment measures first. Um, so we'll always have a conversation in my office about what we can do prior to putting, putting somebody under the knife. Um, walking aids are just kind of one of the more simple things that we can talk about and do to help offload some of the pressure on the joint and alleviate some of the symptoms from arthritis. Um, you know, from a walker to crutches to pain, um, a lot of patients can get some pretty good relief just from a simple walking aid. Obviously, nobody wants to be walking around with a walker or a cane if they don't have to, um, but this is just something that can kind of temporize and help, help alleviate symptoms before surgery. Um, heat or cold therapy can help. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times patients come to my office and say, hey, Doc, what's better? Should I try heat? Should I try ice? And really, there's no great answer to that. You know, some people find more relief of their symptoms with heat, some with ice, some with alternating therapy. So at the end of the day, you just got to try it and see what your body responds best to. Um, physical therapy um, is a great initial treatment for arthritis. You know, a lot of times patients come in and they say, Doc, I don't really want to do therapy because it hurts when I move my joints and the therapists are just going to want to move my joints. That's true, um, but that being said, the therapists have different modalities of treatment, um, different forms of stimulation, ultrasound, relaxation, massage, so they can do other things other than just move your joints. And there's some pretty good data to suggest that 50 to 75% of patients that have arthritis that go to physical therapy experience some form of relief of their symptoms. So it's, it's definitely worth a try. Um, and I always say, you know, even if you don't get a ton of benefit from the therapy up front that you realize, even if you eventually have to undergo or decide to undergo surgery, your body's gonna be better conditioned, stronger, more flexible, and your outcome is potentially gonna be better um, with surgery if you have to do so. Would physical therapy then become uh, a maintenance uh, task? Technically, yes. So, okay. you know, physical therapy, you don't have to go forever. You know, you, you start going, you kind of learn techniques, use their techniques, and then, you know, most of the time you're transitioned to kind of home exercise programs that you can do on your own. Um, and then over-the-counter medications, you know, I think we've all, if we're medically able to, have taken a, a fair amount of Aleve or ibuprofen, naproxen. Um, those anti-inflammatory medications can be very, very helpful in the short term. Um, I don't like to see patients on chronic NSAIDs or anti-inflammatories just because it can cause significant problems um, with the GI tract, cause ulcers, cause problems with bleeding. Um, so you know, this is, in my mind, more of a, a short-term treatment as well to kind of treat flare-ups um, versus keeping patients on for a long time. I typically don't advocate for that. Um, so. We talked about all the non-surgical stuff, now we'll kind of go to the, the surgery side of things. You know, when would you as a patient start to consider a hip or knee replacement? Um, so is it starting to affect your ability to sleep? That's one of the main um, complaints that I have from patients. They say, you know, I, I can't go on like this because despite trying all of those non-surgical treatments that I just mentioned, I still can't sleep at night, I wake up at night, my hip is aching, my knee is aching, I can't figure out what to do, I need another option. Um, does it keep you from doing things you want to do, from being active, from doing simple things such as you know, walking or going to the bathroom, or you know, if you're more active, does it keep you from walking longer distances, leaving the house, going shopping? Um, so these are all things that, you know, if that starts to be inhibited and your quality of life is suffering because you can't do the things you want to do because your hip and knee is bothering you, then you start talking about joint replacement. And like I mentioned, if you're less active, or if it starts to just affect your simple activities of daily living, it's something that we would potentially talk about. Um, so we'll start with the hip, um, go into total hip replacement a little bit. Um, so these are just very basic um, schematics of a hip. So the pelvis and then the hip joint itself right there, the ball and socket joint. Um, this is a healthy appearing hip. You can see that white there is the cartilage. Um, so the cartilage is kind of a smooth, soft cap over the bone in the hip joint that allows the joint to kind of glide smoothly through range of motion. Um, and on this side, a very simplistic drawing of that cartilage kind of being worn down. 
Um, and the next slide shows uh, a radiographic interpretation. So anytime you come and see an orthopedist and a hip and knee specialist, first thing we always do is get x-rays because that really paints the picture of what's going on uh, within your joint, whether it be your hip or your knee. You can see here on the on your left, the, that's a normal hip joint. So what I look at is I look at the ball and socket. So here's the ball. That's the top of your hip bone. It's nice and round and it's nice and smooth. Um, here the socket, the top of the ball, that's nice and smooth as well. And the, the main thing we're looking at here is that joint space in between the ball and the socket. And that's where the cartilage lives. So on the x-ray, you can't see the cartilage, but you can see the space that the cartilage occupies. So if there's a nice open space here between the ball and the socket, that typically signifies that there's a healthy joint. <coughs> Whereas if you look on the right, the hip, you can see clearly that you lose that joint space between the ball and the socket. There's no space there at all. So you're basically grinding your bone on your bone without any protective layer. Um, you start to see even the ball is moving outside of the socket because the arthritis is so progressed on that side. And it is the most common disability in adults is arthritis, so it's, it's very, very common. Is there anything we should teach our children about how to avoid arthritis, or is there any way to prevent? So there's no really great way to prevent arthritis from starting. Okay. Um, but that being said, there's ways that you can help the symptoms uh, from progressing faster. Um, maybe delay the onset of symptoms, even if you have arthritis. You know, in general, being healthy and active, low impact aerobic exercise. Um, eating a healthy diet um, are, are pretty pretty key to staving off symptoms of arthritis. You know, maintaining ideal body weight is also a, a good strategy as well. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so this is just a, a quick video that we'll go through and, and show you what's involved in a hip replacement. So this is just the schematic of the body. You remove the muscles and the tendons. Here's the hip joint. So when we do a hip replacement, we take the hip out, we remove the diseased part of bone, and ream out the diseased part of the socket. We put a metal cup in the pelvis with a plastic, very special piece of plastic liner. We put a metal stem into the thigh bone and then a new ball. And then we put the hip back in place and we basically reconstruct that hip joint so there's no more diseased bone, there's no more arthritis of the hip. Uh, that's a great question. So it can. Um, historically, that plastic piece is called polyethylene. There used to be pretty significant problems with wearing out of that plastic. About 15 years ago, there was an invention made, it was actually out of Harvard where I practiced a fellowship. It's called highly cross-linked polyethylene. So this, this material has very amazing wear characteristics and properties. Um, to the point that we really don't see much issue with the wearing out of the, the components anymore. Um, that being said, it is still metal and plastic and these things still have a shelf life. Uh, it's typically um, recorded as about a 1% failure rate per year of hip and knee replacements. I think it's probably less than that. Um, so I mean, the way to think about it is even if you have your, your hip or knee in place for 25 years, there's probably an 80% chance that it's totally fine. Um, so this is just showing basically what we already covered in the video. Um, you know, we mentioned that the hip replacement involves removing the arthritic or the diseased portions of bone and replacing it with those implants. And this is a little bit probably outdated data, but you know, at least probably 400,000 to 500,000 hip replacements are done every year, and that number is expected to at least double within the next 10 to 15 years. Um, and this is just an x-ray of what the hip looks like after we do the surgery. So as you can see, compared to this side, you know, we remove the ball, we reline the socket, and then you have a, an entirely artificial hip joint, so you never have to worry about arthritis or disease in the hip again. And then just a breakdown of the different components that we use, like I said. So this is the socket that we put in. Uh, it, ha it has a, a coating on the back that basically allows your bone to grow into that component. So you get really good, long-lasting fixation of that socket in the pelvis. Um, that polyethylene component that I talked about, 
um, the stem that goes down into the thigh bone, and then the femoral head. Um, so that's pretty important. Um, the femoral head that most surgeons use now in the United States is, is made of ceramic. Um, so you have metal, the plastic piece, and then a ceramic head. And the ceramic on that polyethylene has very, very good wear characteristics. So the hips last a very long time. Is that a side effect where someone's body could reject one of those pieces that are put in? So historically there has been talk about um, a potential rejection of metal in the metal implants. Um, more specifically, patients with nickel allergy have been thought to in the past potentially react to some of the, the implants that have more nickel in them. Um, that's a, a cobalt chrome type implant. The implant that we use, the implants are typically made of titanium. Um, and I have never seen any type of adverse reaction to the metal. Um, there are some case reports of that potentially being a problem, but most surgeons don't really think it's an issue. Like total hip replacement, what is the difference between that and pinning? So pinning is something that's more so done for a hip fracture. So if you have a, a broken hip that's amenable, you can fix the fracture site with just some, some pins or screws. Um, but pinning is not a, a treatment option for arthritis. Good question. And that goes along with, there's, a, there's also a hemi-arthroplasty, or basically a partial hip replacement, but that's more so done for fractures as well. Um, so there's different approaches to hip replacement. Um, there's three main approaches that the majority of surgeons use across the world and in the United States. Uh, there's a posterior approach, a lateral approach, and an anterior approach. All the approaches work, they all work well, but some approaches have their own advantages and disadvantages. And I think, you know, I don't think it's a cookie cutter situation. I think certain patients would benefit from a, a certain approach versus another patient might do better with another approach. So I do all three of them, um, but in general, um, I try to do uh, a more cosmetic type of hip replacement through an anterior approach. Um, so more recently, over the last five to 10 years, there's been a lot of marketing um, and advertising done on the anterior approach for hip replacement. Um, compared to the other approaches for uh, hip surgery, the direct anterior approach, we go through the front. We don't have to cut or remove any muscles off of the bone. Uh, we basically, it's, it's through an intermuscular plane, so we can just gently spread the muscles aside. We don't have to cut or remove any of them. Um, so in general, it's a little bit quicker of a recovery with this approach. It's a little bit less pain, um, especially within the first four to six weeks. Um, and in my opinion, there's a little bit less of a risk of a, a dislocation or the ball popping out of the socket. Um, so I, I think it's a great approach. Like I said, I don't think it's for everybody, um, but if I can, um, this, is, this is my preferred approach. And just an example of, uh, these are the, the three different approaches, like I mentioned. You can access the hip from the back, from the side, or from the front. And just, this is an example of that cosmetic approach. So one of the ways to access the hip from the front is, um, it, it's called a bikini incision. So basically, in certain patients, we can utilize the, the natural groin crease to do the surgery, and it heals up quite nicely, and sometimes you can't even see where, where the scar was for the hip replacement. So it's, it's a pretty cool technique. Uh, so now, going to the knee side of things. Um, once again, a, a pretty simplified schem schematic. So here's the femur, the thigh bone, the shin bone, the knee joint, and then this is the patella or the kneecap in front of the knee. Um, you know, nice smooth cartilage on this side, and this is where the, the wear and degeneration occurs uh, when arthritis sets in in the knee. Um, another x-ray depiction, so looking at the healthy knee joint on your left, you can see the space here between the femur and the tibia. Uh, it's nice and congruent, it's nice and wide open. Uh, there's no irregular surfaces. Uh, so you can tell there that there's still a lot of space being occupied by the healthy cartilage in the knee. So that's, I, I hope my knee looks like that on x-rays. <laughs> um, uh, that's a little bit dark, but hopefully you can still see it. Um, you can see here on, on this arthritic knee on your right, the inside here specifically, so this is the medial side of the knee. This is the most common place where the knee joint wears out. You can see there's no more space there like there is on the outside. Um, basically all the cartilage is gone and the knee is, is bone on bone arthritis. So that's gonna cause pretty severe stiffness, pain, um, and limited function when you get arthritis that progresses that far. Um, and then just like I mentioned, you know, trying to maintain a healthy body weight really can't help. So for every one pound lost, you take four pounds of pressure off the hip and the knee joints. 
and for every 10 pounds lost, you decrease your chance of having symptomatic arthritis the next year by about 30%. So it can really make a huge difference. Okay, sweet. And then another uh, quick instructional video here on knee replacement. This is the knee after it's done, but we'll kind of see in a little more detail. So there's the knee joint. We'll strip away the muscles and the tendons. Basically, we use guides to make cuts in the bone like that to remove the diseased portion. We cap the thigh bone with the metallic implant. We put a little tray on the top of the shin bone, and then that articulates with that special piece of plastic in the middle, and that forms that hinge joint to give you a nice pain-free smooth motion. Once again, just showing a knee that has been replaced and We'll go into a little bit more detail, but there are, are multiple types of knee replacement. Um, so there's there's partial knee replacements and there's total knee replacements, and it's all based on where the disease is occurring within the knee. Um, so the knee joint in and of itself has three main compartments. It has a, a medial compartment or on the inside of the knee. There's a lateral compartment on the outside of the knee, and then there's the anterior patellofemoral compartment that's right behind the kneecap in the front of the knee. And depending on where the disease is, you can. Uh, replace each part. And you can see, you know, over probably close to a million knee replacements are being done every year in the United States, and that number is going to go up as well. Uh, so, what we talked about, so this is just kind of showing a schematic of different parts of the knee where arthritis can take over and how we treat them uh, with arthroplasty or replacement surgery. So, on this side, you can see the medial side of the knee is worn down, so we can just replace the inside part, and that's called a medial partial knee replacement or medial knee compartmental knee replacement. Um, in general, if I can get away with performing a partial knee replacement on somebody, so if they just have you know, just one part of the knee that's diseased, and we can get away with just replacing that single part, it's a little bit smaller surgery, it's a little less risk, it's a little quicker recovery, and the knee feels a little bit more like your normal knee because we're not having to take down as many structures in the knee as we would if we were doing a total knee replacement. So it's a, it's a great option and patients do very, very well with these partial knee replacements. Um, so just like on the medial side, if the lateral side's affected, we can go ahead and just replace the lateral side. If that anterior patellofemoral compartment in the front of the knee is diseased, we can just replace that part. And then some surgeons as well can do, uh, will do an anterior and uh, unicompartmental knee or replace the front and the side and not the whole thing as well. I just wonder, like, how do you fit somebody like for their hip or their knee, like a certain size, or are you taking like a scan or to see the size? That's a good question. So there's um, different ways to do it. There's multiple different ways. But in general, what we do is we look at the x-rays and or other imaging that we obtain before surgery. And I'll get into a little bit more detail on that when I talk about the robot. Um, but with or without the robot, we can get imaging. We can use templating software to get a general idea of what size we're going to need before surgery. Um, but at the end of the day, during surgery, when we're in surgery, we have trays that have a host of different sizing options. So at the time of surgery, we are looking and staring right at your anatomy, and we are trialing different pieces to see which one fits your anatomy perfectly, and then that's the, the piece we pick. Okay. Good question. Um, so just the x-rays, uh, so this is an x-ray of that partial knee replacement. So you can see on this knee, the surgeon only replaced the inside of the knee because that's where the, the the damage was, that's where the arthritis was. You can see on the outside of the knee, there's still that joint space, the, the knee looks healthy on the outside, but I would imagine this knee probably looked like this knee, but even worse with the narrowing on the inside of that compartment before that patient had surgery. And then here's a, a picture of the x-ray of a total knee replacement. This is just a close-up of what those implants look like for when we do partial knee replacements or when we do total The, the specific company that uh, I use for when I do my robotic uh, knee replacements um, is Stryker Company, and they have uh, a knee called Triathlon. Um, their triathlon knee has a great track record. Over three and a half million have been put in. Um, patients do great with these knees if the surgery is done well. Um, and they have a, a design of their knee where uh, basically the knee biomechanically is very stable. It has a single radius, radius of curvature. 
Whereas uh, some other implant companies, it's more of an ovoid type shape here. So there's a little bit of shifting of the components of the knee back and forth. Whereas this is uh, basically a round single pivot design. So the knee rotates around a single point. Um, and that's been shown to have a really, really nice track record with good outcomes. Um, so a lot of patients ask about the robot now. Um, I do robotic surgery, most surgeons do robotic surgery. So we'll, we'll go into you know, what What's, what's nice about the robot and how it helps us with the, the surgeries that we do. Um, so in general, uh, the, the robot's been along for quite some time. Um, one of the best things, in my opinion, uh, that the robot allows us to do, um, it really allows us to get a really good understanding of patient anatomy. Um, we'll go into a little bit more detail, but before we do surgery on patients with the robot, we get a CT scan before surgery. If we weren't using the robot, we would basically just get x-rays, which is a 2D representation of your anatomy. The CT allows us to create a 3D representation of your anatomy, of your hip joint, of your knee joint, and basically allows us to go in and plan the size of the components, exactly where we want to place the components, allows us to determine where we want to make our bone cuts so we can preserve bone. Um, it's, it's a very calculated surgery, and um, it's very reproducible. Um, so, you know, in general, the total knee, the partial knee, the total hip, you know, these patients, they recover quite quickly, um, you know, compared to conventional joint replacement. There's some data that shows a little bit quicker recovery with less pain in the post-op period um, and feeling of, of a more natural type of, of hip or knee after it's been replaced. And I, I think it, one of the main um, take home points is that it really is more accurate. So compared to doing it without the robot, without the CT scan, um, there's a lot of data that shows that we can put those components in a little bit more accurately exactly where we want them to be with the robot. Um, so it's been in, in play for over 14 years. Like I said, there's a bunch of data, a bunch of published papers supporting its use. Um, in every state of the contiguous US, it's being used. Um, the, it's patented, the technology, um, and now you guys, you guys tell me there's probably been well over 500,000 do you have that number, Julie, since this is 2019? Yeah, um, last I heard the over, okay, we just hit 500,000 robotic knees. Yeah. So yeah, over 500,000 knees now, so knees and hips, so it's been uh, it's been put to good use, and then these numbers are just growing. Does the surgery take less time with the robot? It, it's, it takes about the same amount of time, yeah. So is that called, uh, a part of striker? Yes. video here. Like a little more Let's take a look at how it works. It begins with a CT scan of the knee joint. A CT scan is a series of x-rays taken at different angles that can help surgeons see things that they can't typically see with an x-ray alone. The CT scan data is used to generate a 3D virtual model of the patient's unique anatomy. This virtual model is loaded into the MAKO system software and is used to create the personalized preoperative plan. Prior to surgery, the surgeon reviews the plan size and placement of the implant, and if necessary, modifies the preoperative plan in order to better position the implant to the patient's unique anatomy. During surgery, the surgeon locates points on the knee in order to register the anatomy in the MAKO system. This process establishes the relationship between the patient's actual anatomy in the operating room and the 3D model that was used during the planning process. This step helps ensure the procedure is executed to plan. Once the anatomy is registered to the 3D model, the surgeon has the flexibility to modify the preoperative plan based on their assessment of the patient's anatomy and range of motion. Then, the surgeon guides the robotic arm to remove the arthritic bone and cartilage from the knee. A virtual boundary provides tactile resistance to prevent the surgeon from removing more than just the arthritic bone identified in the preoperative plan. And visual cues, shown in green, appear on screen to show how much bone to remove. Collectively, these cues help the surgeon stay on the preoperative surgical plan. With the diseased bone gone, a knee implant is inserted into the joint space. And once the surgeon is comfortable with the knee's movement, it's off to the recovery room to begin the journey towards strengthening the knee joint. So 
just to kind of recap what they went over there in that quick video, um, like I mentioned, we get the CT scan, we have a full 3D reconstruction of your exact anatomy of your knee or your hip. That data all goes into a computer system that allows us to pull up in 3D exactly what your anatomy looks like. It allows us to fit the components to the perfect size and allows us to plan exactly where we want to put the implants. And in doing that, it allows us to plan exactly where we want to make our bone cuts to remove the diseased portion of bone. And the really nice thing about the, the Mako robot um, from Stryker is that it has a, a, a haptic, it's called haptic control. So basically, the robot doesn't really let you cut outside of the bone that you want to cut. So it's, it's very controlled, it protects the soft tissues around the bone, and it really allows you to make a precise bone cut. Um, so once we remove the bone, like they mentioned, we basically put trial implants on. And in real time, we're allowed, we can see on the screen exactly how the knee is balanced and how it moves. So we can assess the soft tissue tension, we can assess the range of motion of the knee before we even finish the surgery to make sure that everything is perfect. And then we put the final implants in only when we're happy. Um, so recovery from a, a joint replacement standpoint. Different for, from everybody. You know, I have patients that have had hip and knee replacements that come into my office in seven to 10 days and they're not using walking aids, they're not using any pain medicine, and they feel great. That's not everybody, and that's definitely on the lower side of the spectrum. In general, um, you know, recovery from a knee replacement is about four to six weeks until you're getting back to doing the things you wanna do, getting away from a cane, getting away from a little bit of a limp, and starting to live you know, with less pain than you did before surgery. Um, hip replacements, especially with the anterior approach that we're doing now, patients recover a lot quicker. Um, I'd say probably, 90% of my patients at two weeks are not using gate aids. They're back to their usual activity and very, very happy. With the hip replacement. With the hip replacement. Yeah, it's a little bit quicker, a little bit easier recovery compared to a knee replacement. Um, so, you know, when we're in the office, we kind of we kind of talk about your recovery plan. And every, every plan is different based on social factors, what the, the home situation is like, how easy it is to navigate your home, how much support you have at home. Um, Probably 90% of my hip and knee replacement surgery is outpatient surgery, so you come in in the morning, have the surgery, get up, work with therapy right after surgery, and go home and recover in your own house. Um, that being said, you know some patients have a lot of stairs at home, don't have a lot of social support at home, and have to go to a short stay rehab center until they're strong enough um, or feeling good enough to do outpatient therapy. Um, so, just what I mentioned here, like I said, I think this is a little bit antiquated and not necessarily correlating with my practice because um, my inpatient hospital recovery is less than one day. Um, and then, like I said, daily activities with, with knee replacements is kind of three to six weeks, whereas hip replacements, it's more like two to three to four weeks. And then you know, the full recovery from a knee replacement can be anywhere from six to 12 months. So you know, from even six to 12 months after surgery, I still have patients that are getting stronger getting more range of motion, increasing their activity. So you can continue to get better for a long period of time after the surgery. Um, so, you know, in general, why I do what I do and why I do these replacement surgeries is to get you back to doing the activities that you wanna do and not having pain when you do those activities. If that's something as simple as your activities of daily living, that's great. If you wanna go back to doing something a little bit more active and adventurous, that's great too. Um, so certain surgeons that you will see will kind of tell you that there's certain activities that they don't want you to do. Um, obviously walking, driving, biking, swimming, golfing, dancing, these are all fairly low impact activities. So these are all great activities um, that I want to see all my patients get back to after uh, knee or hip replacement surgery. That being said, like I mentioned, there's patients that you know they want to run, they want to ski, they want to do basketball, they want to jump. I don't think that it's necessarily a contraindication. So I'll never tell my patients that once I do your hip replacement, once I do your knee replacement, you can't do any of these things, but you just have to realize that you know, you're putting more stress on the implant. So theoretically, they can wear out potentially a little quicker over time, but the implants that we use now are very stable and they're very sound. And if we do the surgery correctly, I think they can withstand these types of activities. When I was in fellowship, we did a knee replacement on a patient and four weeks later, or two knee replacements on him, four weeks after we replaced both of his knees, he sent us a picture on the slopes in Vermont skiing. So I mean, it, it can and does happen. How old was he? Uh, he, he was in his late 60s. Gardening on your knees? 
Good, great question. So, kneeling after knee replacement surgery is quite the enigma. So, fifty percent of fifty percent of the time, patients can kneel without a problem after knee replacement surgery. Fifty percent. The other fifty percent, they either can't stand kneeling or they don't like the way it feels when they kneel. We haven't cracked the code as to why that is. Um, but that's just what it is. So I just say there's probably a 50% chance you're gonna be able to kneel just fine. Maybe a 25% chance you can kneel, but you won't like it. 25% yeah. chance you won't want to kneel really at all. So, so I'm surprised that it's outpatient. Uh, do you do blood thinners? Or do you have blood transfusions at all? Um, so blood transfusions are very uncommon now. They were much more common probably 10, 15 years ago. Um, one of the biggest advancements, so there's, a, there's a medicine that we use called tranexamic acid or TXA. Um, I basically give that to all my patients before um, the surgery, basically right before incision, and when I'm closing the incision. Um, and what it does is it stabilizes the healing blood to allow it to coagulate around the surgical site. So blood loss and transfusion rates have significantly dropped after we started using the tranexamic acid. You know, we also do surgery a little bit differently now than you know was done, or at least I do. Some surgeons still do things you know the way they learned how to do it 15, 20, 30 years ago. Um, I don't typically use tourniquets on any of my knee replacement surgeries. Um, maybe 50% of surgeons in the United States still do, but I don't. So throughout the surgery, I'm not I'm not squeezing your thigh and preventing blood from going to your leg. You would think that that's associated maybe with more blood loss because you're not using a tourniquet, but it's actually not because throughout the entire surgery, if I see any vessels that are bleeding, I coagulate them and stop the bleeding so that I have hemostasis or good control of the bleeding at the time of surgery closure or when I'm done with surgery. A lot of patients still do the surgery with the tourniquet on, close everything up, and then let the tourniquet down. And in my mind, you don't know what's bleeding in there at that point in time. So you actually, there's, it's been shown that you lose l less blood without using a tourniquet during surgery. And it's less thigh pain and pain of the muscles, so I think you can recover a little quicker after surgery as well. But blood thinners, we all still put our patients on some form of blood thinner after surgery if they're not already on one. I typically use a baby aspirin twice a day, so that's actually yeah, So the, the bleeding risk is not very bad. Yeah. I love it. I know you um, the average is probably about 90 minutes, I would guess, across the board. Probably the average. Do you, do you do spinals? I do. I do. So I prefer to do spinals unless there's any significant contraindications to doing a spinal anesthetic. You know, it's, it's scary for some patients to think about getting a spinal. Um, but it's actually been proven over multiple, multiple studies with thousands and thousands of patients that the spinal is, is safer, it helps with pain control post-operatively, um, less complications with the organs and with blood clots, and they don't have to put a tube down your throat, you're breathing on your own the entire time. Um, so it's a, it's a very safe um, and effective way to do anesthesia for, for surgery. Was that a similar question about nerve block? Yeah, so I just heard block. And I, I use nerve blocks as well. Um, you know, different hospitals kind of have different policies. Um, but I, I, at the time of surgery, I inject a local nerve block around the knee, um, and some of the hospitals also utilize um, an adductor canal block where the, the anesthesiologist will go in and, and numb the, the nerve that goes around the knee. How long does the average knee replacement last? Um, so that's where I said about a 1% failure rate per year. So even if it's in for 25 years, there's still about an 80% chance probably that it's totally fine. So they last a long time. Um, so yeah, you guys have asked some great questions. We have some time now. If there's any other questions, I'd be very happy to answer. Well, in my case, Medicare says I need two knees. So let's say I decided to go ahead with this. What would the process look like? For going ahead with two knee replacements? Well, on one probably at a time, but. Yeah, no, that, so basically you, you come in, we get x-rays, we establish the baseline, we have a long discussion. I, I typically don't always sign up patients for surgery the first time I meet yeah, them. Yeah. You know, I like to establish a relationship, make sure we've tried all those non-surgical treatment options first. Um, that being said, I, I do have some patients that when they come to the office, they've either tried the non-surgical stuff 
or their, their arthritis is just so bad and their quality of life is so impacted that I would talk to them about getting surgery done. Um, you know, it just depends on when you come in, how my schedule is availability. Um, talk about getting you on, it's right now, maybe it's about eight weeks or so, six to eight weeks to get on the schedule. Um, you have that surgery, if everything goes well, you know, I'd say the average of me doing one knee replacement and then patients coming back wanting the other one done, um, probably an average of about three months in between the surgeries. With that being said, I've had patients that came in at their six week post-op visit and wanted me to do the other one right away. So it's a little bit different, but the average is patients probably want about three months of recovery from the first knee before we do the second one. I did see one of the options for pre-surgery injections, like either cortisone or the other, whatever it's called. What are your thoughts on injections? So I think injections are great. Um, I think they can help some people and they do help some people. At the end of the day, you know, it's kind of a band-aid. You're covering up the symptoms, you're masking the symptoms, but arthritis, osteoarthritis, it's gonna progress and get worse over time. So I think it's a great option for patients that one, are not quite ready for surgery. Um, two, might need some optimization before surgery um, as kind of a, a bridge to, to get your symptoms under control. Um, for a period of time. Now that being said, my grandmother, she's 86 years old, she has pretty terrible arthritis of her knees, she gets a steroid shot once every two years, and she does great. So, I mean, you can occasionally get the patient that you can just get by with injections. It's not very common, but it can happen. Okay, thank you. Yep, so the, the steroid shots were great. Um, the gel shots or rooster comb shots that you'll kind of hear the visco injections. They can work great for some people. There's not great data scientifically to support their use. Um, so the, actually the board of orthopedic surgery doesn't even recommend using them. Um, but that being said, a lot of patients that are ready for surgery kind of want to try anything short of surgery to get some pain relief. And it can and it does work for some patients. Okay. Um, suppose, you know, like you have damage to one and it's one on bone side it was the inside side leaving it can it create damage in like your hip and your finger Definitely. yeah so you know everything works in conjunction from the spine to the pelvis to the hips to the knees so it's very common that you know you see somebody that has a problem with one knee but then all of a sudden they're altering the way that they move the way that they stand the way that they walk um, and that does stress the adjacent joints, you know, even the other knee, even the other hip, even the low back. Um, you know, I'll tell you that I have a lot of patients and there's good data to support that. If you fix the damaged joint, it does relieve pressure and symptoms and pain from the other joints that have previously been affected. Do you recommend any physical therapy or at home uh, exercises to do prior to having your surgery to strengthen the other muscles? And I think that's a great idea. I think certain patients really, really do benefit from what I like to call prehab or pre-physical therapy or therapy before surgery. Um, you know, patients that are definitely weak, very, very stiff, um, that I think can improve because their symptoms are, are not that bad or their arthritis isn't that bad to the point where I think therapy could maybe make them worse or set them back. Um, but in general, I think some, some light exercise and conditioning and physical therapy before surgery is, is great for a majority of patients. Are there things on, now that everything's online, are there things online that I can look up for like pre yes. exercises? Yeah, so um, the American uh, Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons, so A-A-H-K-S, go to that website, they have um, hip and knee conditioning exercises. Thank and then there's another website, AAOS, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, and they have uh, exercises on that website as well. Thank you. .coms or .org? I or think the AAHKS is .org, and I think the other one is .org. surgeons like myself, I have specific exercises that I give my patients to do after surgery. Um, so, like I said, you can use those, but a lot of surgeons like myself have specific exercises that we want our patients to do after surgery. And how long, how long is the, the um, 
regimen of physical therapy afterwards, like two or three weeks or even longer than that? I'd say average is probably eight to 12 weeks. Oh, really? For, for knees, um, for hips it's a lot shorter. Some yeah. patients don't even need physical therapy formally after hip replacement surgery. Um, that's probably more of a four to six week timeline. Oh, so you're saying eight to 12, okay. Mm -hmm. How soon can you drive afterwards? Um, so the, the legal answer is you should wait about three weeks. Okay. Um, there's been studies that have shown it takes about three weeks to get back to normal breaking time after a hip or knee replacement surgery. Um, you obviously can't be on any strong narcotic pain medicine. You've got to be able to get in and out of the car comfortably. Um, so I kind of say three weeks. You know, I, I, do, I have had patients that have said, Doc, I felt great after one week. I'm not taking any pain meds. I'm driving. And I said, I didn't tell you to do it, but <laughs> just close my ears. <laughs> Uh, what hospital are you out of? Um, so I do surgery out of St. Alexius Hospital right here, Huntley Hospital, uh, the Northwestern Hospital in Huntley, Illinois, um, Sherman Hospital, and St. Joe's Hospital in Elgin. And also some of the, the surgery centers around as well. With St. Alexis down here? Right here, yeah. Are you a Medicare provider? I am. Yeah, I mean, they, Colin, you'd be able to answer. Have you had any pushback from any Medicare approval for robotic total joints? No, we can get it approved. There's multiple avenues you can go through. As somebody not affiliated with, with Dr. Harvey, I can confirm that they do cover robotic. And my grandmother had one of her knees done and is getting the next one done on the 12th of this month. And she, phenomenal a result. Walked out. She did a, came in in the afternoon for the surgery. They kept her overnight and she walked out the following afternoon. Um, didn't even need to use the wheelchair or anything. Um, within a couple of months, was able to walk around just fine. So I keep telling her she's going to be running marathons when she does the second one. <laughs> it does make a huge change. And this car is almost completely, uh, I guess, unseen because uh, it does really fade just when you don't make a lot of muscle damage cutting it through. Other questions for Dr. Harvey. First of all, just so you know, Dr. Harvey donated his time to be here today. We did not pay him to participate. So, first of all, thank you for donating your time to everybody. There is a survey that you can give it on your way in. Please complete that for a ruffle. Right, and then we're going to, um, there's a green bag on the door, so can you please fill that out? And then I'm going to put it in the green bag. And Dr. Harvey, I'd like to thank you for all the awesome. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.